for those aspiring entrepreneurs in the room, I'll try to, this is what I wish I knew back then that I didn't know. So um, one was awareness. So uh, here's what I mean by awareness. We were a new company. We were fledgling. We were trying to validate our model. And so we had all these thoughts and emotions and things in our head. But what we really became good at that was a key to our success is leaving all that behind. And when we made a call or we made a meeting, step into the mind of the person we're talking to, right? So this is a product manager, a brand manager. That isn't to say all of them won't appreciate the fact that you're a startup. Many of them will. But what is their MO? What are they there for? And most people in large organizations have different challenges than we did, right? So they wanted to not get fired. And that was a discernible, important goal of theirs, uh, especially when you have something that is risky and new in front of you. Uh, the second goal is they want to get promoted. They want to have good results that matter to their superiors, to their peers, right? That, that are the sorts of things that they can list as the top three bullets in their resume. So within the first 12 months, that was our goal. When we went to meet with a salesperson, uh, with, a, with a brand person, we would say, this meeting that we're having, is it describing an idea that could be listed as one of the top three bullets in the resume? That, that, I mean, that's, that's how we tried to position it, because that's what it takes to get somebody to take a risk and try something new. So leave your own shit behind is, is what I want, one thing I'd say. You, you know, you may be nearly insolvent. You may be facing all kinds of things. But when you're opening your mouth, you're talking to somebody, you're there for them. And so understand that and, and really try to be a, a selfless in that meeting, and that'll be the best way to help yourself. The second thing I, I wish I knew was persistence really does matter. You always hear these stories, and you're like, I don't know. You know but our, our biggest customer now, one of our largest, is an insulin manufacturer. They've spent over $10 million in advertising with us over the last four years. I called them 22 times, 22 times, and I left voicemails. First of all, that's not a good idea. You should not leave voicemails. That many times. But, but I did. And, and, and these stories work. I mean, you know, persistence really does work. So if there's somebody out here that's on call 17, keep calling. Uh, if you really do believe in your product and they're the right person, do it respectfully. But persistence does work. Uh, so, so that's a piece of advice that I would so give that's you. That's great advice. The top three in the resume, it's funny. Our first cus big customer, um, the, uh, the guy who made the decision to go within our first business, which was an inventory management analytics business, um, he told me years later, I said, so why did you make the call? He's, they've been very successful. They've made a lot of money. They've been extremely successful. He just became he's sort of the heir apparent in the company and, and doing a great job. And I said, tell me about, you know, I'm, I'm always curious, like, what made you decide that day? Because I remember walking in, and he was sitting here like this doing the bad cop thing. And then his boss came in, and he had the same deal. He was doing the bad cop thing. I'm like, oh, boy, we're, we're in trouble. <laughs> we're not going to get this sale. We ended up getting a pilot, and it went. But, but he said... You know, I was a new guy in this position, and I've been looking and saying to myself, something's going to help me make my mark, make my name. And, uh, and he said, I bet on you guys, and it's paid off really well for me, and it, it'll always value the partnership for that. Yes. And uh, you know, I, I wasn't savvy enough to have seen that that was what it was, but it, no, no question, and he's one of my closest personal and professional friends because of it. But it's, yeah. a, great, it's a great insight because sometimes you, you think in generic terms when you think about big companies and the person yes. and the job. There's one more tidbit, Pat, I'll throw in there Please. if that's okay. Please. This is something I wish I knew. Deliver. Deliver on what you're going to say you're going to do. So we were at Abelson Taylor. They're not too far. It's an ad agency in the medical communication space. And we were in their old office building. And I went to see them when I had two screens. We really had two screens at the time. And they were like, okay. And they took the meeting. The next time I saw them, we were at 100 screens. This was the agency that gave us the Takeda business. And they said, you know, we thought you were a cute kid when you came in with two screens. We didn't think we'd see you again. When we got the email that you were 25, and then 50, and then 100, we said, okay, now we know you're going to get to two. Now we know where you're going to get to four. And whether you're talking to investors or you're talking to uh, uh, customers, you know, as something new, you innately have a degree of, of a lack of credibility. I mean, you just do, just by nature of people not knowing you. Well, and bigger organizations are risk averse. Risk averse. So the biggest thing you can do, and it really matters, if you're wondering, is this going to lead to a deal, deliver. It, it actually matters less what you're delivering as long as it's valuable than just delivering. And too many organizations that are too early have 50 things up. I mean, if you're Google size, I'd say, great, have labs. But if you're a startup, the advice that I would give is focus. Get something done. 
because that track record of getting something done, of being a winner, that goes a very long way. People want to buy from winners, and it's an aura, and you, you really just need to deliver. That's the biggest thing I, I, I wish you know, I knew early on that you discover right away. Yeah. And I'll expand your persistence and add consistency and branding to that as well. I think what was really important for us as well was to get that name brand awareness. So. Um, we got some trade pubs, a lot of direct mail, definitely a lot of calling, but even simple things like having a professional looking business card, having a website that actually works, that they can actually contact us, that has advisors or the, ex explains what the company is. A lot of times we'll have a, had a doctor say, we Googled you guys last night and yeah, you guys are real. So we were very new, but we were real and that gave them a lot of comfort. Um, so investing in those things that sometimes feel like, well, we don't really need these, you know, every, we are face to face, but people do do their diligence, especially for large organizations that are risk averse. Um, and it really helped us to have some of that branding, branding and branding consistency um, for them point. to feel like, okay, this is something real that's being built. You know, it's a new one that I've seen recently because now LinkedIn sends you who looked at your, at your profile. <laughs> I'm amazed by places we go or people go where I look the next day and this organization, so and so looked and, and it's, uh, it's amazing. They, they really, they use, I mean, what they use to go is really beyond what we would have thought of just a website now, mm -hmm. um, which means I better make sure my LinkedIn profile is up to date. <laughs> um, so I want to weave in some of the questions here. Um, so figuring out a pricing model is an interesting thing when there's no market for something. Yeah. Um, and advertising has its standards, but at the same time, this is a totally different uh, context. Uh, no pun intended. How, how did you... Uh, how did you figure out your pricing model? What was, that, what was that journey like? So I'd say take advantage of zero base. So what I mean by that is, like we struggle with this now too, right? So, so when you're a startup, you, have, you can play like you have nothing to lose because you don't have anything to lose. You can go for it all. When you're in the middle of a deal, take all the value you can get. I mean, make it good for everybody, but take all the value. Optimize, right? All of a sudden, as you start getting bigger, you have something to lose. So, well, we could optimize, but what if we lose this? You become innately risk averse. So big companies that compete against you don't start with a zero base. They, they, it's hard for them to move radically. They move incrementally. So when we came in, we said, well, you know, we're creating a market. Let's figure out exactly how much value we're delivering and then take it all, as much as we could. So we said, we don't want to just be in the commoditized advertising business. We know what we're doing works. We want to bet on ourselves. And so let's figure out exactly how much script lift we're, we're delivering for our brand partners. Right? That's, that's how we monetize our media. And so let's measure it. And, and a lot of companies that came into our space wanted to shy away from that. They didn't want to measure it. Right? They wanted to just sell into the commoditized ad market. And they said, well, we're just like TV. We're just like the web. And one of the things that, that you can do as a startup is you can play a little fearlessly and you can bet on yourself. Because if it's not working, it's better to fail fast and know that it's not working than to create a charade that's eventually not going to scale. And so we wanted to measure it right away. And so we said, OK, let's get the data. Let's figure out if it works. And then if it works, let's go make the case that we should take all of it, leaving enough for, say, a three to one or a four to one return for our advertiser. So it was value-based pricing. And it's easy to embrace value-based pricing. So, so talk really concretely about how you did that, because it sounds like a great concept. I'm yeah. sure a lot of people are like, I'd love to do that. What does that but, mean? But, it, but in the context of a market we haven't done it before, like talk specifically about how you did that, because I think there's a lot of people who nod their head go to work tomorrow and go, wait a second, how are we going to pull this off? Yeah. So I guess in our case, right, Takeda, it was one of our early clients. So the question would be, how do we charge them? So we said, okay, it's probably reasonable to charge them based on the number of physical locations they're in because that's how our product works. It's in a certain number of locations on these screens and waiting areas and exam rooms. Now we do some other stuff, but that was it back then. And so we thought that's a, a fair unit. So then the next question is, how much do you charge per office? How much do you charge per location? And so others that were in this sort of a market would just pick an arbitrary number, and they'd often bake it out of <coughs> CPM, right? Cost per thousand. So they'd look at how much it would cost to reach a group of people, either targeted or not, on television or on display ads. And then they would back out that number and go to, to Pharma, which was our customer base, or Health Foods, and say, well, this is how much you're paying to reach these people on TV. Uh, you know, you should pay this much here because uh, we're better. And we went a little bit further. And the way we did that is we said, okay, let's figure out exactly how much lift we're generating. 
Let's go the extra mile, right? Display ads can't do that. You can't do that on that. You can't get the sale done. All you can do is inform somebody. You can't do it on television. But what's unique about our place, the reason we're starting this such a strange business around media in doctor's offices and hospitals, is this is where the action is. This is where people do things. So let's measure how many more of them are doing something based on this information than not. 